and language um, history of you know, literature, mm -hmm. a book history of the literature, mm -hmm. and specializing in the Meiji period and natural language. Right? Yeah. So um, they are all integrated, mm -hmm. all blended in her today's topic, I think. So language. Mm -hmm. Of Empire in Taiyo Magazine, 1895 to 1925. Okay, does this microphone make a difference? Can you? Okay, I'll use it just in case anybody needs to hear me better. Um, so, Setsuko had a great introduction. I would just like to mention um, I found it interesting that Martin uh, brought up the computer science students taking Japanese because about 20 years ago when I was 18 I started taking Japanese as a computer science major and now here I am not doing software development doing Japanese instead so a, a kind of roundabout path to where I am now but here I am so today I'm going to talk about this project that I started last year um, that I'll explain why it ground to a halt for a little while because it turned out to be more involved than I expected it to be, of course, as technical things go. But I'll tell you a little bit about the project, and then I'll tell you what I've done concretely so far working on it. So first of all, I'll just explain what is Taiyo, for those of you who don't do Kindai uh, media history. I may be, I'm not sure how widely known it is, but it was one of the most popular magazines in the late Meiji, Taisho, and I guess uh, extremely early show up period. Kind of a general interest magazine, it came out monthly. Pretty thick, um, lots of illustrations. They started experimenting with lithography right when it started in 1895 and just printed pictures of the most random things in every issue just to like draw in readers. So it's very cool to look at it in person. And it covered all kinds of different topics. So it was current events, politics, but then had literary work serialized in it covered culture, arts, head translations. And it was published by Hakubunkan, who I actually studied as part of my dissertation. They were one of the biggest publishers of this period. So in terms of my project, what was I interested in with regards to Taiyo Magazine? So at this time, as I'm sure pretty much everybody is well aware, um, the expansion of the Japanese Empire began in about 1895 with um, annexing Taiwan, then colonizing Korea, increasing hostilities leading up to the Pacific War in China, the puppet state of Manchuria. Um, I came across in graduate school the um, language of Naichi and Gaichi, the homeland and then the colonies, the outer lands. Um, which always really interested me, um, along with this discourse of Pan-Asianism, trying to draw the colonies into Japan in this very complicated way. Um, as a side project, I'm also very in interested in kind of the Meiji nostalgia that shows up in the 1920s. As a book historian, very interested in changing technologies, the spread of literacy, and ultimately the changing idea of the nation, drawing this language together. How do people think about being Japanese and what Japan means at this time, which is really changing. So um, just to go over the questions that I had formulated when I first came across Taiyo Magazine, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Once again, um, you know, what is the relationship of Japan and its colonies? How are people talking about what Japan means what it is, how do they think about themselves versus the colonies, um, and again, how is the Meiji period or the Meiji emperor being talked about because um, Taiyo started right at the end of the Meiji period and then in the Taisho period, of course, the death of the Meiji emperor and the end of the Meiji period was a topic. So what can Taiyo, this general interest magazine that prominent authors are writing in, what can that tell us about the discourse of the time? So what was I working with? And Martin, I think, rightly alluded to Japan being rather behind in digital publishing of um, both contemporary works and historical documents. There are the um, NDL digital collections are always growing for this time period, but unfortunately OCR is next to impossible on pre-war Japanese, Chinese, and Korean texts. And it's a separate project that I'm working on at Penn right now, but um, have yet to acquire funding for that one. 
it's a much larger scale than, than this project. Um, but I was very excited to find that Tayo magazine has been hand-entered by um, the National Institute of Japanese Language and Linguistics um, in Japan. They didn't do the whole magazine, but they did about 3,200 articles from five select years. And so this text is available to me that wouldn't otherwise be possible to analyze by computer because it would just be a page image um, with, of course, this wacky layout and lots of advertisements and illustrations, as I said, so it's really hard to convert that into plain text for the computer without doing it by hand. Um, luckily, they also put in a lot of metadata for each article, so like the author, title, genre, according to um, Nippon decimal <coughs> classification, like their equivalent of LC call numbers, and what kind of language it was, just a ton of linguistic stuff in there. And of course, no illustrations or advertisements, so the format does change from looking at the print version, but you always lose something in the translation to machine-readable text, so just have to deal with that. And also, thanks to Interlibrary Loan that allowed me to get this DVD with the corpus on it, because of course it's not online because of copyright reasons, but um, always thank you to academic libraries in the United States who supplied me with this corpus. Um, I already kind of went over the fact that it's just a different interaction with the text than original readers would have had, so keep this in mind as I talk about it. That's the limitation. So I had um, a lot of issues, a lot of questions to ask about the corpus itself when I started, not just my research questions, but very practical questions. So as for the metadata, I want to grab that out of the corpus where do I store it and how in a format that I can analyze later. Um, I'll explain what I mean by stop words, tokenizing, and dividing the corpus. Another question um, was sharing data. What can I share from my, uh, of course the results of my research I can share freely, but in terms of the raw data or the data that I process, I brought this up at a conference that um, Ogiso Sensei from Ninjel was in attendance at, and he said, please refrain from redistributing the data. So I have my answer there on that one. But so I'll tell you about my first steps with these concrete questions in mind. What did I have to do to make this work? Um, and it was a lot more work than I thought it would be. So going from page to text, so you have this digitized page of a book or you have even with this hand keyed, supposedly clean machine readable text, you still have to do a lot of work to get it into a format that will work for your specific purposes. So as I alluded to, um, get the metadata out of the files, clean it up, possibly store it. Um, you may have to remove some technical information from the text, you may want to tag words with parts of speech or other information. And then if it's Japanese and Chinese, as you know, there is no white space separating the words which the computer expects to see. So then you run into the problem of segmenting the words and putting spaces between them. And in my case, uh, these came as one file per issue of the magazine. So I had to split it into separate files, one per article. That was my decision. So I already told you about the research questions, but my goal was to remove this, these technical um, XML tags from the document to clean it up, make a CSV, which um, is basically like an Excel spreadsheet for the metadata, put spaces between the words, and then again, I'll explain what stop words are, but that's basically words that software should ignore because they don't have a lot of meaning. And then I was interested in using three tools, Wayant tools, AntConc, and Topic Modeling tool to start visualizing and exploring the data. So this is what the initial files looked like. And even if you're not familiar with XML files or um, you know, text that you might just receive with a lot of technical metadata in it, you can see this looks kind of like a mess. And over on the left is the Japanese text from the article, but all these blue <laughs> text is all the tags that I had to remove. So um, with, given that I have a computer science background, I dove into this myself, and I will say 
Um, as you'll see, I went through a lot of steps. This was difficult even for me because this is a very poorly documented process. So I encourage those of you without programming knowledge to seek out collaborators, not just somebody who can do the work for you, but somebody who has a genuine interest in your question and wants to work with you who has those skills. There are computer scientists out there who are very interested in working on this kind of project, and also linguists who tend to have more programming skills as well. So I used a programming language called Python, which had some plugins. Beautiful soup is for HTML, which really is like a soup most of the time. <laughs> so that's where that name comes from. eTree works with XML. Um, CSV library to create that spreadsheet, and then Mecab puts spaces between words for you for Japanese. Um, finally, Jupyter Notebooks is a great piece of software to manage your Python code in a web browser to collaborate with other people and to see the results live of your, of your uh, code. Um, another really useful tool is a text editor called Text Wrangler, and that's uh, what I used to just view the text. Um, I really like that software, it is free. I'll explain why I had to use both Google Sheets and Excel, um, and then finally the three tools that I was interested in once again. So the first hurdle I had was what's called encoding. So when you see a plain text like the one that I showed you, it can be encoded in a variety of formats, and that basically tells the computer what are these um, codes that make up the characters. What am I seeing here? There's one called Shift.js that you might be familiar with from your web browser that's specific to Japanese. Well, these files were in Shift.js and not the more common Unicode. There is basically no documentation for how to convert it to Unicode, which is what you have to use for Python. So I did a lot of Googling and managed to figure it out through trial and error after a while. <coughs> But um, I had to switch to a different version of Python to get it to play better with Unicode. So the point really is that even now the assumption in the computing world is that you're dealing with Western Roman languages and it really, a lot of software, a lot of programming languages do not work well with things like Japanese, which is really frustrating. But moving on, um, as you saw that blue text in the file, I needed to remove that because I don't want the visualization software to see that as part of the text that it should visualize. Once again, Python doesn't play well with Japanese, so I had to use Text Wrangler, which lets you search and replace in an entire directory of files, so I didn't have to do them one by one, all 3,200 files. Um, and I converted all of the Japanese tags to just a Romanized equivalent. But um, Kiji, the word for article, which divided the articles up, when I was processing the file, I didn't notice the tag that says the Kiji ends here. And I created a 1.2 gig corpus and didn't know why that had happened, but basically every file had most of the issue in it, and they got smaller and smaller as I divided up into articles. Um, I felt like an idiot after that, but I solved the problem using Beautiful Soup, um, which works well with messy XML. And I finally managed to get rid of all the XML while extracting the metadata into a spreadsheet. So you can see all the blue tags are gone. You can also see on the left just how many files I have. This is only the first issue of 1895, and it's not even the whole issue. So again, 3,200 files at the end of it. And here we have all this text that does not have spaces in it. Um, and I will get to that in a minute. But how to save the metadata? You can also see just from the beginning of the file name that I put some of the metadata in the file name itself. So um, it's starting with the year and the month, and then it goes on to put in title, author, um, genre, type of language. And I wanted to also capture that in a spreadsheet, but I'm a little paranoid about losing the spreadsheet and then not knowing the metadata for all the files. So just, just to make sure I kept it, um, I held on to that in the file name. Um, one other problem I ran into with Unicode is that creating the spreadsheet in the <coughs> older version of Python doesn't work with Unicode, so I had to rewrite all of my code in the newer version of Python, but now it's in the newer version, so that's great. 
And finally, at that time, Excel still couldn't import Unicode CSVs at all. So I had to save it in Google Drive, export it as an Excel sheet, and then open it in Excel. So there used to be this silly workaround. Now, now there's no more need for the workaround, so that's a big accomplishment. But it did get really needlessly complicated. So here's a sample of my spreadsheet. You can see I've got title, author, um, what kind of thing it was. So you can see some of them are shosetsu, some of them are donsetsu. So it, it just tells you um, what type of article it was, style of language, whether it's spoken or written. And then for the text itself, so the meat of this project, I want to analyze the actual contents of the articles. I'm finally at that point. So I used what uh, MECAB, which calls itself just another morphological analyzer. It is pretty much the only one for Japanese. It's not just another. I wanted to use a dictionary to segment the words that's specific to uh, Kindai Japanese, written Kindai Japanese. And then I ran into all kinds of problems because the default is a different dictionary. There's not really any documentation about how to change them. Also, just about every tutorial uses one option with the software, and it doesn't work with this dictionary. So I did, again, a lot of Googling, thanks to actually Mark Ravina at Emory. I got um, the dictionary choice working, and I found a lot of Japanese blog posts that kind of tangentially related to what I was doing that let me figure out, oh, I have to use another option, and then it'll work, <clears throat> excuse me, with this dictionary. So again, lots of trial and error, lots of just trying to interpret. I learned a lot of technical programming words in Japanese from these blog posts, so I did learn a lot. Finally, here's the text separated into words with spaces. Very exciting. <laughs> Finally, I got to start looking at what was in the corpus. So I started with some software that's actually free online. You can use it in your web browser, voyanttools.org. Um, pretty easy URL. And I do have um, all the links to the things that I used at the end of these slides. Um, I'll give them to Setsuko and I'll put it on my website so you don't have to write everything down now. Um, so I created this huge list of words that I wanted it to ignore, and that was a really iterative process. Every time I looked at the visualizations, I found more and more words that I didn't want in the visualization. And I'll show you some example screenshots of what that looks like. Um, Voyant Tools now will segment Japanese into words with spaces. That's a new feature as of last year, so you don't necessarily have to do it yourself. You can just load a text as is in Voyant, which is really cool. Um, I didn't want to do that for various reasons, including that my corpus wasn't contemporary Japanese, but um, if you have like a news article or something, you can just try it out yourself. It should work pretty well. I also tried out what's called topic modeling tool, which uh, my colleague at Penn maintains now, Scott Enderly. And it's a uh, software that works on every operating system. It has a nice visual interface for topic modeling, which I won't go into the methodology today, but it's another way of exploring your corpus. Um, I thought at first, oh, I should tell it to ignore even more words because look at this junk that it's returning to me. But then it turned out it um, grouped a bunch of text together as fiction based on these like little interjection words and dialogue words that I thought were meaningless. So it, it makes you rethink what is a meaningful word in what context. Um, also the top political article was a translation of Tolstoy. So it really makes you rethink what is Japanese literature and what is Japanese political discourse if Tolstoy is what everybody was so interested in. Um, and I won't talk about ANCOG today because I'm just trying it out, but that's like software for corpus linguistics. Um, actually developed by somebody in Japan, but um, mostly used in the English-speaking world. So this is what Voyant looks like, and you can see this word cloud on the left. There's just a lot of particles and words that don't have a lot of meaning to me. 
in there. And those are the most common words, of course, just like in English, it would be a, the, but, and, words like that that you don't care about. So this tiny bit of text is about a quarter of the list of words that I decided to ignore. So you can see this took forever to just copy and paste out of way out. Don't want this word, don't want this word. But look, it gave me something meaningful once I told it to ignore all of those words. Now I get more um, salient words like, you know, Navy and citizen, um, prefecture, army. And this is just for the January 1895 issue of Tayo. So you can see what were people talking about at that time. So I just, again, have started to explore the corpus because it took so long to clean the data. So what I'm interested in now, I've kind of narrowed down my topic. I'm interested in foreign policy with regards to East Asia, and I'm including Russia in East Asia in that category as well because of the Russo-Japanese War and all the interactions in Eastern Russia um, as regards to Japan. So I had some surprises. Uh, Chuboku never shows up in the 1895 January issue, but um, Chang Nation does. Like, oh, of course, but you know, I just didn't think about that. Um, other things just came up besides like Shina, I expected to be in there, but there were just other words for China and Chinese people that I didn't expect to be there. Um, so I'm interested in looking at more wars and just seeing how we're, Japanese talking about their enemies and about other people in Asia. I'm also interested in the 1917 year of articles because of the Russian Revolution. So lots of interesting stuff in there. What can I learn about what people are talking about, at least in the context of a general interest magazine? But as you can guess, there's a lot of human interpretation involved in that. The computer can only tell you the beginning, then you do the work. I guess at both the beginning I did a lot of work, then the computer can tell me some things, and then I do even more work. And finally, this is a page that I think will be very relevant to you in the slides. Um, tools and resources, these are all of the things that I used in my research so far. Maybe not all of them, but some important things that you'd want to check out. And then also some tutorials at the bottom um, my colleague Heather Froelich wrote a great um, introduction to using Ant Conk. She's a corpus linguist at Penn State. Um, in May, the very end of May and the beginning of June, I taught a text mining workshop for Japanese at Emory with Mark Ravina and Hoyt Long. All of our materials are up online, and Mark made a really great guidebook to Japanese text mining. So you should check that out, that's online. And finally, you can take a look at my blog. I've, also, I've often put up mini tutorials of how I did things like web scraping or cleaning this corpus or various other things. So again, I'll share these slides so you don't have to write down a bunch of URLs. And finally, if you want to get a hold of me about this project or anything else related to Japanese text mining, um, you have many options, including visiting me at Penn if you're in the area, feel free. Thank you.